As a church, we believe in and regularly practice water baptism. After you've made the decision to follow Jesus, baptism is your next step. It is a public declaration of the life-changing decision you've made. Our next baptism is on the 14th of August, so if you'd like to be baptized, please sign up at the info desk or WhatsApp us on our WhatsApp number. And I'm so excited for today. We've got Pastor Marinette Van Collar with us. Here's, here's a little known fact. She's from Sasselberg. Yeah, all the volleys are like, yeah, we knew there was something about her. She's originally from Sasselberg, ended up um, in Cape Town, and her and her husband Paul moved down to Zambia to pioneer um, what is known as the Zambia Project, um, just, to, just having a heart for the western province of Zambia. And ended up really pioneering an incredible work, planted many churches, um, led Hope Church in Zambia, um, and they've now grown to a church of 10,000 people recently. 10,000. Um, it's insane. It's insane. And then um, felt God calling them back to George and planted a church in George, Hope Church George, just under 2,000 people at the moment. Am I right? And, and God has pioneered something incredible. So to lead Hope Church George and Hope Church Zambia is amazing. And then, as if that's not enough, <laughs> they also pioneered Ark in South Africa and Southern Africa. So they are part of um, planting churches across the nation um, and across the continent and also empowering pastors to lead life-giving churches. So they are pastors of pastors and leaders of pastors and encourage pastors. That's amazing, isn't it? And so just to show you what God has done through them, and obviously we know it is God's favor upon their lives. And so we're just grateful that we can be a part of what they've done, and we're grateful that they can give up of their time and their effort and their energy to encourage us. So church, why don't we stand as we welcome up Marinette this morning. Give her a round of applause. Thank you so much. I feel so special to, to be here. And I completely agree with Randy. You are an amazing church. It is awesome to be here. You can take your seats. Thank you. I have Natasha with me. If you want to quickly stand. It's nice to see such a full church. She's, she's our executive pastor and she's also a very good friend of mine. we sharing a hotel room and this morning when she saw me, she said, Oh, this is a boy bike. And I said, What is Roy? And then we're like, This is a Roy bike. <laughs> it was so not planned. And we're like, Shawnee and Ray. <laughs> it wasn't. We were like, That is so funny. <laughs> but Shawnee and Randy. Roy Baiki, are absolutely incredible people. I've been in full-time ministry for just over 20 years. That's quite a long time to serve God as a pastor. So you, you do get wiser and you do learn and you can more confidently prophesy things. And... They are people that love God, they have stood firmly, they've been obedient to God, so I can say their future looks incredibly bright. This church is going to grow, God's going to pour out His blessings here, and I just have a sense that maybe both of you, you have things that you trust in God for, but you're not so sure if God wants to bless you as individuals and you as a family. And I just want to say God wants you to know that he wants to bless you. And maybe you see a lot of poverty around you and people struggling. The reality of poverty doesn't make the reality of blessing wrong. We have a God who blesses us and he wants to bless you. And Randy has a gift to communicate the word of God on his life. So that is also such a blessing as a church. And I love their children, Levi and Amelia. They're just gorgeous. Well, I have some pictures of my family up. So 
There's my husband and I so happy because we're baptizing an older gentleman. We're all about reaching people that are far from God, just like you are here at United Church. And then the picture where we all fall together, which is very hard to get. I have to plan it and say, guys, we are going to take a family photo today. This is for me. You can do it for mom. And it was taken two weeks ago when we had a serve day at our church where we went into our community to serve. So you can see how big they are. They're 15 and 17, and I'm officially the shortest. It happens. <laughs> Seth is with the blonde hair, and he's sharing a message there at Youth Sunday. It's awesome to see our children grow up serving God. And there's Nathan, three weeks ago, in a rural village in Western Zambia, sharing the gospel to people who have never heard about the name of Jesus. And Paul was there. He said he communicated the gospel so clearly. <laughs> so that's what we're all about. We work in Zambia amongst an unreached people group, people who have never heard about Jesus. And then we're also in George, and we absolutely love what we're doing. As a family, we try and take communion together often. When the kids were younger, it was easier because you could say, come sit, we're not going to break bread and remember Jesus together. But now that they're a bit older, it doesn't happen every day, you know, maybe once a week. But what I did is I went into a crazy store and I got shooter glasses, dot glasses. <laughs> but we've redeemed them and we use them for communion. But I think sometimes if people open our covers, they're like, what are these pastors doing? And I'm like, no, that's for communion. That's not for something else. <laughs> so these two boys of ours, they're not at all interested in girls. It's amazing, hey? It is. But now when I travel, I say, can I bring you gifts? They're like, yeah, what about some cologne? Cologne? <laughs> then it makes me wonder, you know. When they, when they were little kids, so they lived in Zambia. Um, our oldest son was just about to turn eight when we moved it back to South Africa. So they grew up there. Zambia is so much home for them. But when Seth was about around seven, he quite shyly shared with me, he thinks he wants to be a pastor when he grows up one day. I was like, oh, that's amazing. Whatever you do, we'll support you. And then that night, we were all together as a family. I said to him, tell daddy what you told me today. And he's like, I know, I was like shy, you know. I said, no, tell dad. Ah, like, oh, dad, I think I want to be a pastor one day when I grow up. And we're like, that's awesome. We'll support you in anything. But James, then I felt sorry for his five-year-old brother just sitting there. So I said, and Nathan, do you know what you want to do when you grow up one day? He says, oh, yeah. And I said, what do you want to do? He's like, I want to be a senior pastor. <laughs> <laughs> but that is Nathan. That's our son, Nathan. He's our boss. And he's a born leader. But yeah, it's, it's amazing to raise our children in God's house. I love your theme for the year, build. And, you know, God wants to build his kingdom through you and through me. He wants to build his kingdom through people. But before he can do that, he wants to build his kingdom inside of us. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at a story in the book of Nehemiah. And we're going to learn from the people in that story. And we're going to look at nine things that we can do to see God's kingdom being built inside of us so that he can build his kingdom through us. So the book of Nehemiah has 13 chapters. The First to the seventh chapter is all about rebuilding the wall, the wall of Jerusalem. So Nehemiah left the city of Susa in Persia. He went to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall. And chapters 8 to chapters 13 is now about the restoration of the people. Okay. Do you know how long it took to rebuild the wall? 52 days. It's so quick, don't you think? I was like, wow. 
Guess how long Nehemiah stayed in Jerusalem? Twelve years after that. Because it's hard work to restore people. The restoration of people, the building of people, are hard work. It's easier to build a wall. <laughs> so the rebuilding of the wall was really just a symbol of what God wanted to do inside of the people's hearts. God wanted to revive them. God wanted to restore them. So what happened is, 52 days, walls finished, the people gathered together for a meeting, and they said, what now, God? <laughs> and then something incredible did happen. A revival started. Revival defined is an improvement in the condition or strength of someone or something. Who wants to be strengthened? I'm raising my hand. Who wants to just improve and get better and get stronger? When we use things, it needs to get improved. So my husband's a runner. He always says he needs new shoes. Because if you run a lot, you're going to need new soles for your shoes. And for those of us that have vehicles, if we drive a lot, we're going to need new tires. And that's so expensive just for tires. And if we have cell phones, come on, young people, we're going to need upgrades. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> we're going to need to upgrade our, our phones. And so it is with the human soul. And we all have a soul. And have we lived? <laughs> the past two and a half years have been hard. And so many of us in the room are struggling with hopelessness or depression and anxiety and heaviness. But I have good news today. God wants to revive us. He wants to restore us. So... I'm going to ask that you all stand. Is that good? And then we're going to read together from Nehemiah 8, from verse 1. So the people were standing on the day when the word of God was being read to them. So now we can relate to the people. They were actually standing from morning till noon. They were standing for six hours. So I don't know, what time did you plan to have lunch? <laughs> don't worry, don't worry, we won't do that. Let's read together. Verse 1. All the people assembled with a unified purpose. Doesn't that just remind you of United Church? With a unified purpose? Yes. To cultivate unity and hope? As at the square just inside the water gate. They asked Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given for Israel to obey. So this would have been Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. They only had those five books. Verse 2. So on October 8, Ezra the priest brought the book of the law before the assembly, which included the men and women and all the children old enough to understand. I love that right now, United Church has United Kids and United Junior Youth, where the Word of God is being explained to the children in a way that they can understand. Verse 3, he faced the square just inside the water gate from early morning until noon and read aloud to everyone who could understand. All the people listened closely to the book of the law. They wanted to hear from God. Who wants to hear from God today? So let's listen closely. Verse 4. Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform that had been made for the occasion. To his right stood Matatia, Shema, Anahia, Uriah, Hikia, and Masiah. So to his left stood Padiah, Mishael, Malkiah, Hashum, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Mushalam. I did it! <laughs> that was so stressful! <laughs> Verse 5. 
verse 5. <laughs> Ezra stood on the platform in full view of all the people. When they saw him open the book, they all rose to their feet. They placed so much value on the word of God. They were so committed to hear from God, to hear God speak through his word. Do you know how privileged we are to have access to the word of God? These people didn't have a Bible. They were so excited to just gather and the leaders were going to read from the word of God and they would stood. It's a privilege to have the word of God that's alive and active in our homes. Where we work in Western Zambia, so many people's languages have never been recorded. So they can't read and write. Even if you give them an English Bible, it's not going to help. There isn't even a Bible in their own language, but they still can't read and write. So we've partnered with Wycliffe Bible Translators. They're very clever people. And they come and they help us. It's a process that will take us years, but we're translating five previously unrecorded languages into the Bible. So definitely pray for the work of God in Western Zambia. Verse 6, then Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people chanted, Amen, Amen, as they lifted their hands. Let's do that. Amen, Amen. It means, so be it. It is true. We didn't come to church today to watch a band play or to watch some lady tell stories about Zambia, you know? We came to participate, and we came to engage. So please feel free to shout amen at, at the right time. Eh? <laughs> if it's not at the right time, you'll know. It's like <laughs> and clap, if something's clappable from the word of God at the right time. If it's not the right time, you will know. It's <laughs> then they bowed down. And worship the Lord with their faces to the ground. So just right where you are. You, no, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm so joking. Don't worry. It will just look weird. It was like my husband will see pictures of us. And like, what were you doing in church? That's just the weird. <gasps> Verse 7. The Levites, Joshua, Bani, Cherubiah, Yamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodia, Messiah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabat, Hanan, and Peliah then instructed the people in the law while everyone remained in their places. So what the leaders did is the people were all standing like this and different leaders would gather different groups as they were standing and they would help them understand what's been shared from the word of God. There's eight. They read from the book of the law of God and clearly explained the meaning. And that's what happens here at United Church. The word of God's clearly being explained of what was being read. Helping the people understand each passage. Isn't it amazing when you read a passage and sometimes it's like a light bulb goes off and you can just understand it? And what a privilege to then help someone else understand that passage. Verse 9. Then Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites, that just means all the leaders, who were interpreting for the people, said to them, hey, don't mourn or weep on such a day as this, for today is a sacred day before the Lord your God. For the people had all been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. What a presence of God there must have been. Verse 10. And Nehemiah continued, go and celebrate with a feast of rich foods and sweet drinks. That also reminds me of United Church, because you have a value of celebrating. And there's always food everywhere. I was like, I come, and there's food, and there's... <laughs> That's just amazing. And share gifts of food with people who have nothing prepared. This is a sacred day before our Lord. Don't be dejected and sad. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Do you agree with me? We have so much to celebrate. We have a God who sent his son Jesus to die for us on the cross, for our sins. And death could not hold him down. So on the third day, he rose again. And our God is 
for us. Our God is not against us. He has good plans for our lives, plans to prosper us, plans to give us a hope and a future. And here we are. We're still alive. God still has a purpose for our lives. Verse 11, and the Levites too quieted the people, telling them, hush, don't weep, for this is a sacred day. Verse 12, so the people went away to eat and drink at a festive meal, to share gifts of food and to celebrate with great joy because they had heard God's words and understood them. Before we look at nine things we can learn from the people in the book of Nehemiah, Let's pray and commit the rest of our time into God's hands. Father God, thank you so much for your word that's alive and active and that shows your dreams and your plans for our lives. God, right now we place ourselves under the authority of your word and we ask that you will change us, that you'll correct mistakes we have, help us understand your word. And make our lives whole. In Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. You can take your seats. Thank you. Verse 1. All the people assembled with a unified purpose at the square just inside the water gate. They asked Ezra, the scribe, to bring out the book of the law of Moses. Amazing that they asked her which the Lord had given for Israel to obey. My first point is, if we want to see revival, if we want to see God's kingdom build inside of us, we need to gather. So well done. We are gathering here today. You know, some people will say that they love God, but they don't like the church. So they'll just worship God alone at home and It doesn't work. You can't say, I love Jesus, but I don't like his wife. Because (laughs) the church, the church is God's idea, and the church is the bride of Christ. And when Jesus returns, what is he returning for? His bride. And the church is the bride of Christ. A while back, I spoke to a lady in our church in Georgia, and I was like, hey, good to meet you. You're new to Hope Church. And she says, ah, no, I'm a church hopper. I'm like, explain that to me. She's like, I hop around to different churches. So I go visit all the churches. Every Sunday I go to a different church. It's amazing. I said, no, you shouldn't do that at all. You should have one church, one church family where you belong, where you put your roots down. So take your next step here to United Church. It's not a perfect church. No church is perfect. If you find a perfect church, don't go there. You're going to spoil it. Churches aren't perfect. It's true. It's true because we're people. Hebrews 10 verse 35 says, We should not stop gathering together with other believers, as some of you are doing. Instead, we must continue to encourage each other even more as we see the day of the Lord coming. Then my second point, if we want to see God build his kingdom inside of us so he can build his kingdom through us, is that we need to have a unified purpose. It says all the people gathered together, all the people who all the people? It was like the rich, the poor, the young, the old, the educated, the uneducated. How many people gathered with a unified purpose? Chapter 7 says 50,000 people. That really is a lot. My third point, if we want to see God build his kingdom inside of us, if we want to experience revival, is we need to have a hunger to hear God's word. I love how the people said, bring the word of God. People were hungry for the word of God. Are we hungry to hear God's words? My fourth point, if we want to see God build his kingdom inside of us, is we need to be obedient. 
the people in the, in the story uh, place themselves under the authority of God's word. They said, you big, we're small. What do you want us to do? And listen, God doesn't speak to be heard. He speaks to be obeyed. So when God speaks, we obey. James 1 verse 22 says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. A.W. Tower said, have you noticed how much praying for revival has been going on of late? And how little revival has resulted? I believe the problem is that we have been trying to substitute praying for obeying. And it simply will not work. Verse 6. Esther thanked the Lord, the great God. All the people responded, Amen! Amen! As they raised their hands and then bowed with their faces to the ground and worshipped the Lord. My fifth point, if we want to experience revival, if we want to see God's kingdom being built inside of us, is that we need to pray and pray and pray and pray. We pray. We pray about everything. We pray everywhere. God's always with us. We can speak to him at any time about anything, and it's a two-way conversation prayer. It's not just us speaking to God. We still, and we hear his voice. We hear him speak from his word. A lady a while back told me about a husband that was so sick. So I said, let's pray for him. She says, I, I don't think it's come to that yet. <laughs> <laughs> and then a similar thing happened. I was in a coffee shop, and a, a guy walked in, and I remember his son had a, an injury in his leg. And I said, how's your son's leg? He says, no, he played hockey, and it's, it's really struggling, man. I feel so sorry for my son. I said, let's pray for him. He's like, no, I don't think that's needed yet. <laughs> So I'm like, prayer is not our last resort. It's our first response. We pray. My sixth point, if we want to experience revival, is we need to worship with undivided hearts. That's what the people did. And you know that you are worshiping effectively if in your time of worship, you sense that you're very small and God is very big. You have a sense of his greatness. I love the posture of the people. They had their hands raised and they were on their knees. Do you know what it means when we raise our hands? It simply means we surrender. <laughs> That's what we're doing. We say, you God, we're not. When we were children, we used to play A-team. Who remembers the A-team? With face, you remember A-team? B-A, come on. Everybody always wanted to be B-A. And so many of you don't know what I'm talking about. So it's like cops and robbers, you know? But somebody will say, hands up, and then you put your hands up. But that really is not our surrender. So when we're in God's presence, we surrender. And that's amazing. But it doesn't matter what your body is doing if it's not in your heart. If it's not in your heart, it doesn't matter. Because God looks at the heart. You know, so often young girls will say, Oh, I love this guy, he's in church. He's in the front row. And he loves Jesus. And I'm like, how do you know he loves Jesus? Because look at him, he's holy. I'm like, get to know him. Get to see what type of life he is living. Just because someone has the right posture doesn't mean they have the right heart. That's why we take our time and we get to know who people are. Because God looks at the heart. 2 Chronicles 16 verse 9 says, The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. God is looking for a church that is fully committed to him so he can strengthen United Church so that he can build his kingdom through United Church. Verse 8, 
They read from the book of the law of God and clearly explained, it's so important, hey, the meaning of what was being read, helping the people understand each passage. My seventh point is we need to study the word of God. It's important that we study the word of God. And here at United Church, we have Grow College. And there's even a course that is all about reading and understanding the Bible. So go sign up for it. I saw in the bookshop, there are so many Bible studies. There's a six-week one I want to get. I like the colors on the outside. So. <laughs> it's like tie-dye, pink colors. I'm like, oh, I can do that study. <laughs> oh, I'm judging a book by its cover, Randy says. Psalm 19 verse 7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect. God's word is perfect. Reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. Making wise the simple. So even children can understand the word of God. Verse 9. Then Nehemiah, the governor Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who were interpreting for the people, said to them, Don't mourn. Or weep on such a day as this, for today is a sacred day before the Lord your God. For the people had all been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. The people weren't crying because they heard a sad, moving story. They were crying because they realized how perfect God is. As they were listening to the word of God, they realized how big God is, and they were in awe, and they trembled in his presence because they realized they're not perfect. They realized he's a holy God. When you don't read God's word, if you never spend time in the Bible, you'll think you're doing very well. People will say to you, how are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Going to church. Doing very well. But if you spend time in God's word, you will realize that you're not perfect. Because God's word reveals to us what is broken. And we all fall short of the glory of God. But praise God. He's a good God. He's in the restoration business. And he restores his people. My eighth point, if we want to experience revival and see God build his kingdom inside of us, inside of us is that we need to repent and ask God to change us, just like the people there. And he's like, God, change me. Change me, God. We all need to change. When God convicts you of an area in your life that needs to change, don't feel bad about it. Feel glad. Because God loves you so much that he wants to change you into the image of his son. Verse 10. Then Ezra said to them, Go your way, eat the rich festival food, drink the sweet drinks, and send portions to him for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be worried, for the joy of the Lord is your strength and your stronghold. Maybe somebody here today just need to hear, do not worry. Do not be worried, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Let's look at my nine points again. If we want to see revival, if we want to see God's kingdom being built inside of us, we need to gather. We need a unified purpose. We need to have a hunger to hear God's word. We need to be obedient. We need to pray, 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 pray. We need to worship with undivided hearts. We need to study the word of God. We need to repent. And ask God to change us. That's a very important one. And we need to choose joy. My ninth point is we need to choose joy. Did you notice I say we need, 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 we need God. We need him. We all have this in common. Doesn't matter if you're on a mountaintop or in a valley, we in desperate need of God's grace. And your neediness does not repel God. Your weakness does not repel God. In fact, your neediness attracts the power of God. 
His power is always ready and available to flow into a surrendered heart, a heart that is sold out for him. God, we need you. Nehemiah 8 verse 10. And do not be worried, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Do you have joy? Do you have joy? If you are a follower of Jesus, you have joy. And you're thinking maybe to yourself, no, I don't. No, you do have joy. If you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And the fruit of the Spirit is joy. And Jesus said, I give you my joy. I give you my full joy. I give you my complete joy. But then you may wonder, so why don't I have joy? If you're a believer and you're not experiencing the joy of the Lord that is your strength, then we just need to help you release the joy today. <laughs> so releasing the joy, the well of joy that is inside of us is like priming a pump. You pump and you pump. Until the joy is released, until the water comes out. So I relate so well to this because in Zambia, we put water wells into areas where people don't have access to clean and safe drinking water. So I just want to show you this video that was taken a while back. <laughs> Delicious, cold, pure, clean, safe drinking water. But you know, when you're priming that pump, when it gets very hot, that's when you just keep, you keep pumping because you know the water's about to come out. So when we want to release the joy, the well of joy that's inside of us, we have to prime that pump. And do you know what the handle is? The handle is gratefulness. The handle is thankfulness. If you're struggling to have joy in your life, start rejoicing. Start thanking God for all the good things you have in your life. Thank Him that you're alive. Thank Him that He has a plan for your life. Thank you that He's brought you through so many things. Thank Him that He saved you. Thank Him for your family. Just keep thanking God. And I promise you, if you keep thanking God and not give up, you will experience joy. The joy will be released in your life. Can life's struggles and life's problems block the joy? It can, but it doesn't have to. Because... Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I'm going to ask that we all stand as we get to a close. You know, giving people clean and safe drinking water is a privilege. It's like, oh wow. It's amazing to give people water, a basic need. But you know what? Nothing compares to giving people Jesus. And Jesus, when he was on earth, was talking to a woman at a well. And he asked her for some water and they got into a conversation. And in John 4 verse 13, Jesus answered her and he said, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. But the water that I give him will become in him a spring of water, satisfying his thirst for God, welling up, continually flowing, bubbling within him to eternal life. This verse describes a revived heart. This verse describes a heart that's been restored by God. So today, I would love to pray for us to be revived so that God can build his kingdom in us, so he can build his kingdom through us. So just right where you are, if you, if you want to be included in this prayer, we can all close our eyes, bow our heads for privacy, but I'm raising my hand. <laughs> if you can raise your hands, and I can know if I can include you in this prayer. That's amazing. If you want God to come and revive you, 
That's awesome. Wonderful. Father God, we thank you for each and every person here today, Lord. God, we pray that you will revive us again so that we can rejoice in you, Lord. Come and restore us in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. While we're in this attitude of prayer with all eyes closed, if you're here today and you're not yet a follower of Jesus and you want to give your life to him, can you just raise your hand so I can see if I can pray for you to receive Jesus today as your Lord and Savior? Fantastic. Anyone else who wants to give their life to Jesus today? If you can just raise your hand. Wonderful. So I'm going to say a prayer. And if you're giving your life to Jesus, you can please just repeat this after me. But the rest of the church can also pray together. Father God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for me. I now give my life to you. I surrender and I turn my back on my old life because I have decided to follow Jesus and there is no turning back. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, everyone. What an amazing message. Yo, grab your seats. Go ahead. Grab your seats as we wrap up this morning. Are you blessed this morning? What a great encouragement, eh? Sometimes we need to be reminded, encouraged. For those of you, maybe you came in feeling a bit weak. Maybe you were strengthened this morning. For those of you who might have forgotten some truth, you were reminded this morning. Isn't that good? I, um, as we wrap up this morning, I want to give an opportunity. And you don't need to feel any pressure. Don't feel obliged. But I want to give an opportunity for us to partake in, in blessing Paul and Marinette in their ministry and what they do. Um, I, don't even, I don't think I fully explained the scale of what they really do. Um, and, they, and the work that they're involved in. You've heard a bit more about the Bible translations, installing water wells, and there's so much more. I love one of their projects called Hope Art, um, where they empower ladies in the community to create art and then end up selling it, and it benefits the people that make it as well. It's incredible what they do. We just want to create an opportunity to bless them. And there's a verse in Galatians chapter 6. In the NLT, it says this, Those who are taught the word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. And I want to read from the Amplified because it just gives a different perspective. It says, um, the, one who t- the one who is taught the word of God is to share all good things with his teacher, contributing to their spiritual and material support. If you would like to be a part of Blessing Marinette, the way we're going to do that is we're going to send them a gift of thanks, an honorarium. And you are more than welcome to participate in. All you, the only way to do that is to make a transfer and say, hey, reference it, Paul and Marinette, or just Pastor Marinette. And it will go to them. And the reason why we do that is we want to say thank you. Because like she said, it's an act of gratitude. It's an act of saying, hey, something happened in me and I want to say thank you. It's not about the amount, it's about the act. So don't think like, okay, well, I didn't budget for this. Just whatever amount you can, just to bless them, to be a blessing. Why? We are blessed to be a blessing. blessing. Amen. Fantastic. Why don't we stand this morning as we close off with a blessing. I'm glad you were helped. I'm glad you were encouraged. Pop by the foundation store like Marinette mentioned earlier on this morning and grab a book or grab a Bible and bless someone um, as an act of generosity on your side. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. May he be gracious to you and may he give you peace. Be blessed. Have a phenomenal week. See you next week.